It's about time! Civilization VI is getting an expansion and there are big changes on the way. The expansion is set to release on February 8th, 2018 and more specifics will be released bit by bit as we build up to it in the coming months. Anton Strenger is the lead designer for this expansion and wrote an overview article that I linked below and in this video I'll be talking about the new points and then my analysis and opinions of them and also some interesting guesses. So let's get started. Point 1. Culture and Storytelling As an overview, this is a culture-based expansion aiming for dynamic empires with unique stories every time you play. There's a lot of focus on your civilization being a story and actually forging its own unique history along with a lot of diplomacy changes to add depth and options. So every addition and change we'll be talking about is centered around this idea. Now, before talking about the new features, let's talk about new civilizations. There's going to be nine new leaders with eight new civilizations in this expansion. And there's some guesses that we could have of which civs are on the way, at least from the cinematic they showed off. For example, is this Queen Seondyok of Korea? Are these Mongolian horse riders? And what are those archers? They also mentioned there's going to be a balance between male and female leaders. Though as it's been going, it tends to lead slightly more towards male leaders anyway. And they're also open to reworking old civilizations and leaders for balance, so some existing civs might be changing. I will be covering the new civs as they get announced on this channel, so you'd want to subscribe if you want to see those. But also, I want to ask you guys, which civs do you think are going to be added, or just the ones you hope they will add? Alright, now let's talk about the new features. Firstly, there's gonna be Golden and Dark Ages. It was mentioned in the past that Dark Ages were never a part of the game because they found players preferred to be rewarded for good decisions rather than be punished for bad ones. So you could trigger good things by doing well, but you'll be left as default otherwise. This is also why negative global events haven't been seen in this series for a while. These ages this time around are tied with the new loyalty mechanic, which we'll be getting into, and Golden is good for loyalty and Dark is bad. But it's balanced by the more Golden Ages you have, the harder it is to get another, while having a Dark Age makes a Golden Age easier to get. The Dark Age also has special Dark Age policies that will help activate an even better than Gold Age, the Heroic Age, equivalent to three Golden Ages, basically. As forging stories is part of the underlying concept for this expansion, instead of looking at the game from the tech and civic eras, we're now looking at each era as a chapter in a story. When you enter a new era, you can trigger a golden or dark age based on the previous era's score earned by certain objectives. So overall, this sounds very cool on paper. It's important to note that although a dark age can be seen as bad, it's also an opportunity with a great catch-up mechanic. And I'm a big fan of catch-up mechanics. A player going into a Dark Age and successfully activating a Heroic Age will overall come out on top compared to someone activating a Golden Age. Getting a Dark Age isn't so much a punishment for bad play and it's just an alternative which you can capitalize on. How it actually plays and if it's fun though is yet to be seen. Maybe if two warring players where one enters a Golden Age and the other enters a Dark Age could turn the tides of battle a bit too much? It's all tied into how loyalty is affected though, so let's talk about that. Now the loyalty mechanic is something like culture flipping cities back in previous Civ games. Cities with low loyalty can even declare independence and become free cities. Loyal cities have pressure too, kind of like religion, and it spreads to nearby cities. Pushing the loyalty up in your cities can end up expanding your empire and conquering your neighbors without even going to war. The previously mentioned Golden and Dark Ages act as a loyalty bomb, or a loyalty drain. I really like the reintroduction of this kind of mechanic as it provides another option to success and victory outside of military might. It's also a way to break the deadlock between two players who are just throwing units at each other. One side could focus a bit more on defense and boosting loyalty, or actually push borders out by flipping a city. The quickest way to boost loyalty, however, is to send a governor to a city, so let's talk about that for a bit. In past Civ games, you could kind of specialize cities by telling them to focus on production or growth or something. In Civ 6, districts add another layer of specialization. But this time, civilization is getting a specific character that you'll be able to send to a city to manage it, and they have their own abilities and bonuses, much like in Master of Orion or Stellaris. 
You can earn up to seven governors, and each has their own skill tree they unlock through promotions. You earn governor points through gameplay, and use the points to upgrade existing ones or unlock new ones. The governors are kind of like the existing AI too, with their own preferences and agendas. Some like working on existing developed cities, while others prefer building up a new city, and some even work well during war. There'll also be a governor you can send to a city-state, enhancing your envoys there. Now it is a common request for Civ games to include features that exist in other games, but Civ also gets a lot of hate for quote-unquote copying other games. Regardless of that, the inclusion of governors seem to add another element to gameplay, but depending on their bonuses and ability to specialize a city, it's hard to say right now whether this is going to be a meaningful inclusion or just another task to check off the list. I hope it's an actual choice and part of your strategy on whether or not to focus on governors, and not something that you just have to do or get left behind. Alright, now onto some diplomacy changes with alliances. As they stand, alliances are pretty much just a guarantee that someone won't declare war on you. Now they want there to be proper motivation to work together and not just sign a let's not bother each other agreement. Alliances now have types, research, military, economic, cultural, and religious alliances that changes the benefits included. Also, the longer you remain allies, the better the benefits become as the alliance levels up, decentivizing breaking the alliance. Because they are so powerful, you can only have one type of an alliance with another player at a time, but you are allowed to change the type later on. This is a definite step up on the diplomacy side for Civ 6, and even in terms of the Civ series, alliances have always been a bit fickle. Incentivizing long-term alliances is an interesting prospect for single and multiplayer, and it could make some compelling breakdowns as it gets to late game and victory is imminent. The different kinds of alliances also adds another level of specialization, and at this point it seems like you could hyper-specialize an area with policies, districts, and now governors and alliances, while also trying to take advantage of golden and heroic ages. Then we have a new mechanic to the series meant to be a catch-up or reward mechanic for players that get too far ahead. Emergencies are times when a player does something really significant like converting a holy city or using a nuke. The player that's ahead is targeted and marked a threat and other players can choose whether or not to join together and face that threat. Joining means extra benefits if you achieve the set objective, but if the player that's targeted as a threat succeeds instead, they get the benefits. What's interesting here is that it's meant to curb a player from getting so far ahead everyone else doesn't stand a chance anymore, and if everyone else doesn't work together, it will only further strengthen the lead of the player ahead. A concern is if it's too punishing for the player marked as the emergency, or too rewarding for the victor. But it could be a great solution to games where you know you no longer stand a chance and just give up. This is also another diplomatic addition, pushing players to work together even if they aren't allies and increasing the depth of diplomacy. Well, that's the idea anyway. And another more conceptual addition is turning your playthrough as a civilization into more of a unique story with new ways to track progress and historic moments that are like mini achievements. Circumnavigating the world, training your first unique unit, founding a religion, and there are bonuses if you're the world's first to do it. Achieving these things increases your era score, increasing the chance of getting a golden age in the next era, and it's all added to your civilization's timeline, which is a nice aesthetic to show off what you've done in the game, but also a nice reminder if you're coming back to an old save and forgot what you've actually done. The whole mini-achievement thing is nice, and it does tie into golden and dark ages, so going for them adds a bit of a questing feel to your civilization, but I don't think this is going to be anything too game-changing. What's more interesting is the return to almost purely aesthetic, fun things coming back to Civ. Like decorating your palace in Civ 2, it didn't really do anything but people loved it. Filling your timeline like a tapestry of your civilization's history is cool, and I'd actually like games in general to try adding more fun things that aren't always necessary to be super practical or functional in terms of adding gameplay. Just fun cool things, and I, I like this timeline tapestry idea. And of course it's going to be important to guess what's more to come. Looking at the cinematic, we can see some interesting things, like not just new civilizations, but also plagues and diseases maybe? Maybe there's going to be a World Council mechanic again, which was promised to be coming to the game in the past, and maybe this expansion is its chance to get in. 
they tend to show off new features in these cinematics as vague clues. So there's a good chance those are coming to the game. Looking at the screenshots released, we can also see new wonders and natural wonders. And looking around, you can just see all sorts of things. Hmm, look at that. And that. Hmm. And I'd like to ask you guys, what do you guys see? Do you see something interesting that I'm not seeing? Anyway, as a conclusion, I think overall this sounds like a really good expansion for Civ 6 that might be able to add the depth and complexity it's really been needing. On paper, this could solve some long-standing issues with the series, but we really have to wait until we see more details to come to a complete decision. In Civilization style, many people have felt the game is incomplete up until this point, and a lot of people think of the expansions as actually fixing the game or adding in features that should have been there in the first place. Either way, I'm hopeful though, and I'm also hoping they don't charge too much money for this. And for those of you who have been waiting to buy the game, they'll probably have a big sale on the base game when the expansion hits. Alright, and that's basically all we know about the upcoming Rise and Fall expansion for Civilization VI. What do you think? Do you think there are good additions and changes? What are you most worried about? For those of you who think Civ VI is broken or just isn't good enough, do you think this will fix it? I'd love to know what you think as it'll help my own and others' perspectives. Also, if you'd like to check out more Civ VI content, informational or gameplay, check out the playlist linked on the screen right now, or check out some of my other series for some nostalgic PC gaming. And do subscribe if you'd like to see more Civ 6 coverage as we find out more about this expansion. And that's all for now. Thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. And I'll see you in the next video.